Good evening, everyone. Without further ado, I'd really like to welcome everyone who's made the huge effort to join this virtual commemoration event to commemorate the 80th anniversary of Le Paradis. Because of the ongoing battle with COVID, the invisible enemy, we have no option but to remember what happened at the parody in this way. We were lucky enough to have Colonel Andy McDowell lay a wreath on behalf of the Royal Scots and all the British Army last Saturday at Le Paradis. Particularly welcome to those representing those villagers in Le Paradis who year on year never forget what happened there 80 years ago. We're also very glad to have with us this evening those members of the Royal Norfolk Regiment who fought so gallantly alongside us in enabling Dunkirk to happen. So important. We also have at the heart of our service this evening veterans from the parody and their children. That will be very special and it will bring it to life. Finally, I'd like to thank the Reverend Ros Trafford Roberts for agreeing to conduct the service, which will be very important to us as well. And also to Corporal Alan Thompson of the Royal Regiment of Scotland, because that is our golden thread. The heart of the Royal Scots goes on and beats in the Royal Regiment of Scotland. Also, I'd like to mention that the exhortation will be delivered by Brigadier George Loder, who is chairman of the Regimental Trustees of the Royal Scots. We have an untold story to tell. That is the story of the Royal Scots at Le Paradis. So let us watch that film now. It's about 10 minutes long. The 1st Battalion of the Royal Scots, some 770 men strong, landed in France in September 1939 as part of the 4th Brigade of the 2nd Division of the British Expeditionary Force. For the next eight months, the Royal Scots prepared and manned defences across northern France, even taking a turn in the massive concrete fortresses of the French Maginot Line. When the German attack in the West finally began on the 10th of May 1940, the battalion crossed into Belgium and had their first contact with the enemy west of Brussels at Wavre. As the Allied forces were pushed back by the German Blitzkrieg, the Royal Scots fought back across the French border. Meanwhile, the Germans raced for the Channel coast, splitting the British off from their allies plans for their evacuation were then prepared. As the Germans turned north, it became vital that their advance was delayed long enough for the main part of the British Army to reach the beaches at Dunkirk. On the 25th of May, the Royal Scots were brigade reserve at calon sur lys The same day, the 2nd Battalion of the Royal Norfolk Regiment received the full weight of the enemy attack on the Labasse Canal, suffering heavy casualties. That night, the Royal Scots were moved to new supporting positions. This was the setting for the Battle of Le Paradis, one of many battles to the last man which saved Dunkirk and the British Army. At dawn on the 27th of May, 1940, the Royal Scots were ready to face the final day of their battle for France. The story is told by a former Royal Scot whose father fought at Le Paradis. It, on the last light of the 26th, it was, it was known that there was, they were warned that there was going to be this major assault uh, during the dark hours of the, the 27th. And indeed, they began to hear 
armoured movement, which was uh, the, the tanks had managed to get across further to the east, get across the canal. And this was a rev revelation because uh, they didn't really, uh, that's the last thing you wanted. A Company managed to, at dawn, managed to disable a couple of uh, light tanks because they were light in those days. And uh, with Private Carson on the anti tank rifle, and then Land Corporal Anderson and Private Redpath managed to get forward and uh, put some grenades into the, the tanks and wipe them out. So, basically, a very brave act by these guys. And in fact, what it did, it had the accumulative effect to, to take out the tanks. The tanks never appeared again in the battle. The dawn attack coming from the west was was first thing to come in and they came into Lee Corny Mallow. The C Company was the first to get hit and it was a, a very, very vicious action in which saw at the end of it a, a large number of SS casualties. But uh, the, the retribution that the SS melted out, they, they basically massacred the uh, C Company when eventually they succumbed, which would have been about nine, 10 o'clock the A Company uh, bore the brunt of the, the assault coming up from the south and they stood aside the road and they, they fought on gallantly until basically they had run out of ammunition and the, the last uh, attack that came in they defeated it by collapsing a, a structure, a wall onto their, their attackers and went over and finished them off by hand so they would have then withdrawn, tried to get back to uh, Paradis and, and, and making their way back, they got uh, uh, captured. It's point, point noting that A Company at that time was supported by the two Manchesters and uh, some Norfolks. There was 12 Norfolks also in that company. So it was a very mixed bag, A Company. So there was a few of them there. The rest of the the Norfolks were hanging on in Jury's Farm, all in the, the, the area, which was just behind where A Company had been captured. Uh, up at Battalion HQ in Paradise itself, B Company had come back into the, uh, were drawn back in, and they were put under command of a, a Captain Gordon, who was a Norfolk, who couldn't get back to the Norfolks. But they were put into the, the west end of Paradise in the area of the church. And if you visit there, it's worthwhile looking at the church. You'll see bullet holes. The figure of Christ in the back of the church is, is sort of cut in half of them, where bullet holes run across. And also the, uh, at the front, you'll see the World War One memorial covered in, in bullet holes. And it's worth uh, uh, pointing out that that was the regiment laid post in the First World War for the 8th Battalion Royal Scots. So it's another connection back with Paradis. Uh, so that was B Company's position, and they would fight on there until eventually they were overcome. It was about that time, about quarter past twelve in the afternoon, that the regimental commander of the SS unit had got a very uh, array, I suppose, about the, the rate of progress, and had been driving along to the south of uh, the Royal Scott position, and he was probably shot by a sniper, probably from D Company. And, uh, that was the final straw for the divisional commander. He sent the Weimar to, to try and help the SS out and to sort it out. So they were now coming in from the west, right up the road that the Royal Scots and their regiment laid post at the far end and then their battalion quarters with D Company stretched out along the road. It's there that we had the action with the, the, the pipe major and his pipers. They were the close support for RNHQ and they fought on and were eventually killed. The actual battle itself, they, they, they were moving from building to building. As a building went on fire or something, they, they would move from one building to another. And basically by about half past four in the afternoon, the Royal Scots as a fighting force were finished. Lee Paradis had fallen, the Norfolks in Jury's uh, farm. And so they were surrounded basically, the SS to the the west and the south and the Weimar coming in from the east. And eventually, I reckon about back of five o'clock, they surrendered, about past five. 
And that really, by the, the battle started really in earnest, I suppose, in the early hours of the, the dawn on the 27th, and by five o'clock in the afternoon it was over. But there was a huge uh, uh, toll taken on the SS during that battle. And it's, it's worthwhile just reminding ourselves of the figures which I've got here of the, uh, of the action. I don't have the figures for the Norfolks, but I do have them for the Royal Scots. So from the 10th of May, the Royal Scots have lost 141 killed and some 350 wounded. In that action alone, not the Weimar, but the SS alone, in the action on the 26th, 27th, they lost 155 killed dead, 500 wounded. And that included 18 officers wounded and five officers killed, including all the officers of the unit who faced A Company Royal Scots. And uh, basically, they, 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 they suffered. They, they were overconfident, uh, although well equipped and handsome, fit young men, but they were overconfident and they just uh, they paid the price for it when they, they met Royal Scots at uh, Paradis. Rolf Schuss and Norfolk, something like that. The Royal Scots' contribution to the Battle of Dunkirk was vital, yet most of the survivors of Le Paradis would spend the next five years as prisoners of war. Though the Royal Scots had been in continuous action for 17 days, had travelled over 200 miles, and had suffered heavy casualties, their fighting spirit was undaunted. Their ferocious defense at Le Paradis inflicted heavy losses on the enemy and seriously damaged the confidence of the SS division they fought. Most importantly, it delayed the Germans' advance, allowing thousands of British troops to reach the beaches of Dunkirk. These men would live to fight another day, but only through the courage and the sacrifice of the Royal Scots. We'll now hear the memories of some members of the fine Royal Scots regimental family. And to start with, I'd like to speak to John Errington and his daughter Layla. John was a signals officer in the 1st Battalion at Le Paradis. And John and Layla, um, can you read us some extracts from the diary that John had, please? Yeah, we're going to do it. Go, Donna. You got the diary here. Just read it, Donna. What? <laughs> Just read it. Um, we, we've received orders from, to move to Little France over the water, which I recognise as a village near Aldershot, Petit Fond. And we were moving on this order. And on Sunday, the 26th of May, we slept in a barn at Messen and moved in the afternoon up to Le Paradis by small parties. See, rather involved in the wood battle with the cigarettes and chocolate, which were abandoned from the RAF canteen. On Monday, the 27th of May, the battle began at Paradis. The Huns infiltrated through, and we had to defend the battalion headquarters. Uh, which was set on fire with tracer bullets in the roof, and they had to withdraw to headquarter company's uh, office and defended that to dark. And very little news of what happened to other companies. And on Tuesday, the 28th of May, we laid up last night for some well needed rest and tried to get back tonight if we must avoid the Germans. Don't really know where we are going. 
oh, where the BEF is. <laughs> That's it. Thank you. John, John, that was a lovely insight. And it's so difficult to imagine what it was like to be there and experience it. Um, but you, you're also a, a prisoner of war. Do, do you have a, a memory of being a prisoner of war? Um, well, yes. Uh, it was rather nasty to begin with, but then the Germans begin to realize they might not be winning the war and everything then improved. We moved all over the country from up, up as far as Poland camp and uh, all over Austria and back into Germany. Thank you. And of course, um, there were 292 Royal Scots were taken prisoner of war at and during Le Paradis of whom many were wounded as well. Uh, and five years, as was said in the film, was a long time. John, many thanks indeed. And Leila, thank you very much as well. Can we now sort of move on to uh, Elizabeth Rhodes? And Elizabeth, your um, father, uh, acting major at the parody, uh, can yes. you tell me a little bit about what your father told you about, please? This, this is my father at much the time after he was released. Uh, like most of his generation, particularly those who spent many years as a prisoner of war, he spoke very little of his war service. But we did know, because we'd asked why he had a military cross, that he had by default ended the, his active war in command of what was left of the Royal Scots about 30 men in all on the final day in Le Paradis until they were captured some three days later. He was only 24, so a very, very young man. And I know he took his duty to try and look after the men very seriously to see if they could with any chance get to safety. I now know, of course, having read his diary and the citation and most importantly been to Le Paradis, that those last days must have been horrendous. They knew that there'd been massacres. I don't suppose they knew the precise details at that stage. But I think the thought of what might happen drove him to try and try to drive the enemy back so that at least they might not suffer the same fate. I'm told that he offered the chance to every man to make their own decision whether they would try and reach friendly lines on their own or remain with my father. I gather no one decided to go it alone. He admired his soldiers enormously and wanted it to be known how well they'd fought right, right to the end. And it gives me a huge sense of pride to think that these young men fought on in a way that has sadly been rather forgotten and I'm grateful it's being brought to mind now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Again, the regimental spirit, the comradeship, the resilience, all examples from Elizabeth there about her father, of whom she's quite rightly very proud indeed. Elizabeth, thank you. Ian, can we move on to yourself? And of course, um, we heard you and saw you in the excellent film telling the story, the untold story of Le Parody. Ian, your father was pipe major, and then he became a sergeant major. Can you tell him about his time at the Paradis, please? I found out from a, from a, uh, what happened with my father from the Sunday papers, because on the 30th of April, 1961, I was collecting the Sunday papers, and there was an article right. in, on the front page, Tigers and Tartan, which had a, a sergeant major, C.W. Johnson, and Earl Scott's mention. Uh, when I got home, I asked my father about it because he'd never ever said anything about it, as was their fashion in those days. He told me a little bit more about it, and then that was it left uh, that, really. But he was uh, in charge of A Company because the company commander had been badly wounded and the officers were either detached or killed, so he was left in charge of Sergeant Major. And A Company was a, a side a stride the road, which was taking the full brunt of the, the SS. Uh, 
coming straight up the road heading north. After a vicious action in which they, they had to give up in the end, they ran out of ammunition. They, they came to quite vicious hand-to-hand -hand fighting. But they tried to get away and withdraw up the road when they were stopped and got some very rough treatment from the SS, taken into a field and were about to be shot. Uh, 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 something that had befallen to C Company not long before and was to happen to a lot of other people later on in the day. But by sheer good fortune, a, a staff car came back in pass with a, an SS staff officer in it who questioned what was going on and uh, was, was told and he stopped the whole thing and went up to my father and shook him by the hand and in perfect English said, uh, we cannot shoot such men as these, they fight like tigers. And so that was the, the headline of the Sunday Express, Tigers and Tartan, and that's where that came from. And from that, I think that the, the SS that were there, they were very well equipped, very well motivated young men. They, they were stopped for two days by sheer grit and determination and fighting spirit of uh, the people that were there who were totally exhausted. And it must have affected the SS uh, confidence. And indeed, the Germans in, in the whole, if they thought, was it really going to be worth, the this was what it was going to be like all the way to the, the channel, was it worth it? And so that, that's a, a point that uh, I think is, is worth making. But it was a, a violent action and it was a short shot, but the Germans knew what they were And do you have a feeling of pride in your father? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Uh, it was an old-fashioned uh, upbringing I had, but he was the grit and the oyster that made me and uh, made me what I am, really. But uh, it was a different upbringing, so we're not like fathers nowadays. Uh, but uh, he was, uh, I, I, he did me well. Yeah, and thank you very much indeed. Um, we were hoping, and I have my fingers crossed, that we might be speaking to George Simpson, who um, was 100 on the 7th of May, the eve of VE Day, VE Day, which is questionable if it would ever have happened if we hadn't had Dunkirk. We have now uh, Franny, who is son-in-law of George, uh, mm -hmm. also served as a loyal Royal Scot. And uh, mm -hmm. Franny, great to see you. Um, and is George with you? Yeah, I've got him here, right here, man. Great, George. Yeah, to see you. And wonderful to see you, uh, George. Now, you, you've been uh, speaking to newspapers, been on television recently. Well done, and thank you so much. But could I just ask you, what are your memories of La Parody, George? Well, I was wounded about 10 miles outside La Parody, right? And the rest of the guys were, went on left. And I was taken to prison from there, right? Yes. Otherwise, uh, we, saw, we, we, we knew we were fighting a losing battle, right? But our boys were there. Once a royal, oh, always a royal. I was sick of my friend and died. Uh, I'm sorry for bringing them up. No, George, and, uh, we, we understand. Yes. Sorry? But I was saying we I, understand. Uh, so it, you're, it's, it's all being in it together and being a team, is yes. it, George? I told my that I was, I was proud of being a road squad. That's me. Really. I was C Company. We threw the brunt. And D Company took some button and all. But I could tell you stories that I'm just, but I'm not always to tell you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it's an old day. It's an old day, but I'm proud of being a old squad, a first battalion man. Yeah. George, uh, we, are, yes. we are very proud of you. And that's one of the things we're here today to commemorate, albeit this way, as opposed to going to the parody, of the sacrifices that you and your friends made. And you went off to be a prisoner of war as well, didn't yeah, you? Yeah, five years. I went to a lot of trouble in Germany. 
<laughs> I got into a lot of trouble in Germany. Right. Uh, one day, we had red cross parcels, right? And sometimes the Germans used to give you a, a, a fly visit. There's four of them coming to the camp that day. She said, right, bring out all your tins and put them all and nail them the wall, right? But there's no weed after that. And that caused them for everything and nothing. <laughs> I've got 14 days in there. In the, in the cell, in the camp, but I was, I was proud because the cooks and not always looked after people that did things like that. And anything I could do damage, I did. But what you said were there the rings with everyone. Once a lot, a royal, always a royal. Always a royal. Of the royal. Of the royals. Okay, Thank you. George. Thank you very much indeed. You take care from all of us. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Bye. Ron. Thank you. Thank well, you. Well done, Franny. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. Thank uh, you. Now, we've really had the scene set uh, here. We've heard about the memories of people who served, fought for our freedom in the parody. And therefore, it's very appropriate. We now move on to the act of remembrance conducted by the Reverend Ros Trafford Roberts. Thank you, Ros. Good evening. Today, we gather virtually to honor and remember with pride and thanksgiving those who have encountered death through selfless bravery at Le Paradis and who now see God face to face. In the presence of our heavenly King, we pay tribute to their courage and sacrifice and pray that their souls may continue to rest in the peace and light of his glorious and eternal majesty. We also pray with gratitude for the residents of Le Trême, for their continuing dedication and commitment to the honoring of the fallen at Le Paradis. They shall grow not old, as we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun and in the morning, we will remember them. We will remember them. Remember them.
I invite you all to join in the regimental collet. O Lord Jesus Christ, who art the first and the last, grant, we pray thee, that as thou hast promised to be with us even unto the end of the world, so may the royal Scot be the first to follow thee and the last to forsake thee, who art with the Father and the Holy Ghost, one God, world without end. Amen. And now our blessing. God grant to the living grace, to the departed rest, to the church, the queen, Monsieur le Président de la République, the Commonwealth and all people, unity, peace and concord, and to us and all God's servants, life everlasting. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen.